Thank you. It's great that there are actually people here <laughs> because I thought well, after lunch is usually the coma time and people tend to uh, select uh, more relaxed um, talks. My name is Lea Viljanen. I'm a security person. I've been uh, in security and technical roles for the past tw uh, 20 plus years. Um, and I started with my, my IT career with Commodore 64 in the uh, 80s, so I'm of that generation. So that's how the uh, Ladybug uh, email address came to be. But anyway, uh, I've been mostly a security consultant. I've do, done a lot of security audits, and I will uh, talk about that a bit later. But in the recent years, I've been interested in what other ways there are than traditional audits to actually make organizations and APIs and, and things like that uh, secure. So let's take a, a brief look at the uh, APIs. I'm not an API person, but the way I understand it, the way I've seen APIs used is, is um, basically the business driver. You are going to get some business value uh, with, with an API. That's the point of the uh, reason of their existence. But to get those benefits, whether it's money or, or co cooperation or anything like that, you need to expose these uh, endpoints and these services to the uh, wider world. Of course, you've got internal APIs that a small set of, of uh, your own staff or, or uh, uh, consultants and whatever. Then you might have a partners. You might have a half a dozen partners. You have a, a uh, traditional partnership agreement with, with papers and, and signatures. And then there are the APIs that are basically out there in the internet for everybody uh, to uh, basically use. And the more exposure it has, the more risks you have with those, uh, with those APIs. Because the more people that can actually use them, uh, it is just the uh, more uh, uh, risk uh, there is. So the question is, what are we going to do with this uh, risk? What kind of risk they are? I also run a lot of, of threat analysis and risk uh, management, risk analysis workshops, so we can have like two days of, of uh, just going through the risks of uh, various APIs. But I would just like to highlight, uh, for example, three very typical risks that I've actually seen as part of, of uh, audit engagement I've, I've done in the past. For example, we can have fraudulent transactions, especially if you have any kind of, of um, monetary value or uh, going on with the API calls, um, ordering a pizza, for example, or things like that. If uh, somebody can circumvent the authentication and authorization layers, then they get free pizza. Well, pizza is uh, small potatoes, but you get the, uh, get the idea. And in one, uh, actually, bug bounty scenario, we had a leak of uh, personal information uh, just this, uh, this year, that an a organization had an API that you could make a call saying, uh, give me uh, information on uh, this particular client relationship. And the API gave that one a single record of, of that uh, client, but by manipulating that, uh, that call, it actually dumped all the uh, client records of, uh, of that uh, database. Well, when uh, the organization was uh, confronted with that uh, information, they said, well, it works as designed. It wa there was no actual uh, limitation of how uh, much information you could dump there. And then we got into uh, some conversation about GDPR and, and uh, do these people making this call actually need to know every, every uh, client relationship there is. And it came out to be that, well, maybe uh, this should be uh, actually taken uh, the restricted, and that's what they did. Because if uh, it is a leak, uh, of, of a big man magnitude, you can be subject to uh, uh, GDPR or fines, which are some percentage of, of your uh, revenue, which in a big company can be a, uh, a lot of money. And also the third very uh, common one is uh, different kinds of denial of service attacks. 
Um, if you are thinking of, of you know, service at attacks, you immediately think somebody uh, renting a botnet and flooding your public API endpoint with thousands and tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of requests so no uh, legitimate traffic can actually get through and, and you uh, miss out the business value. However, there might be some more insidious uh, uh, denial of service attacks where actually the number of requests is not that great, but the requests are specially crafted that, for example, your parser gets to uh, do extra uh, processing per each request, and when you make enough of them and, and you cause a lot of, of uh, processing uh, going to waste with those uh, requests. So these are uh, typical or uh, potential uh, risks with the API. So we have all these risks. risks. What are we going to uh, do about it? Well, since I've been in security for 20 years, I've seen the uh, mental model of 20 years ago, when it was basically that the security department was a department of no that uh, when a business had a sort of checklist that if they want to have a business uh, uh, process or, or application out in the, the, uh, in the world, they would have, to, uh, have these gates checked and one of them being get an OK from the security department. And then a week before the launch, they go to the security department and say, yeah, we want to have this application on the internet, please sign here, and the security department is, no. Well. Nowadays, the mental model has somewhat developed from that. Uh, the modern thinking of, of, the, uh, of securing an enterprise, and APIs and whatever, is all about managing the risk to acceptable level. Because you can't uh, basically prevent organizers from doing business because they will be basically dead by that, uh, at that point. But the question is finding out what is the acceptable level of risk for each uh, type of, of um, uh, business unit, and then basically uh, figuring out what security features and processes and tools and hardware and software and things like that we need to actually achieve that. And once again, 20 years ago, we had this lovely, lovely, uh, delicious security paradigm called m, &M security. Uh, it's actually a sort of a nasty nickname for the paradigm that we basically built a hard shell around the company and organization and everything in and put everything valuable inside. What this is basically an M&M uh, candy. So when you actually crack that outer shell, you get all the chocolatey uh, yummy goodness inside and it's all yours after that. So basically, uh, the, uh, the idea that you can have a hard shell and protect everything inside, it's not a very good idea, especially in the, in the API world, when the whole idea is to get cooperation, partnerships, ecosystems uh, going on. Because if you have these perimeter protective firewalls, DMs and uh, VPN accesses, for every partner you're going to bring in, you will need have to configure all of this. And that is going to take, uh, take money and time. I know some uh, big organization who have outsourced their, for example, VPN management. The uh, lead time for getting any kind of VPN access is in the order of weeks. Like three weeks, we can have that access for you. That's not the way to do modern agile business. So basically, this has to go away. So what is now the modern uh, way of thinking? We are talking about defense in depth. I just hinted uh, at things uh, uh, in the previous slide. We, are, we have gone from one single hard outer security layer to multiple softer permeable layers that each pay, uh, play a role in the security posture. So we will have that perimeter protection. Firewalls are not going, to going away but you can have more relaxed rules in the firewall, firewalls. But we have uh, endpoint protection, we have software controls, API uh, have their own uh, security uh, layers like authentication and, and things like that. Um, 
And what is what I'm uh, actually talking about today is more about the processes that are required. It's just not software and hardware. We need to have good processes to be secure in the modern age where cooperation ecosystems and um, agile uh, idea is, is um, really the thing to do. And when we have all these working together, we can turn basically a bit more relaxed from uh, the uh, partnership point of view and not uh, shut everybody out. So here are some of the key processes for, if you, uh, for well, not necessarily for API security, but at least for any uh, technological um, capable organization who does uh, software or, or um, applications. I could have a, a two-day workshop on this uh, alone, but I'm just going to highlight. This is not a complete list, but this is a highlight of what I think are important. Of course, you know, if you are writing any kind of software, you need to have secure coding practices, your uh, SDLC, uh, secure uh, development lifecycle, and if you're developing something or uh, maintaining something, you will have bugs. That's a fact of life. Some of these bugs are even security vulnerabilities. Not all, but some of them. So you need to have some kind of vulnerability management process or method of how to deal with this. What is the structured way of somebody finding on the vulnerability and what to do with it. We also have um, lots of organizations are interested in are we actually secure? And one of the key uh, methods of finding out whether we are secure or not are audits. They are not going away even if, in, uh, if I'm going to um, talk about bug bounties later, because some of the things that we want to be secure of, they are not really uh, candidates for bug bounties. But so we want uh, some kind of process or method or rules for doing audits as well. And if we want to actually uh, allow partners or general public or users to use our APIs or uh, use any kind of resources within our organization, we also need uh, ways to uh, detect whether it be, well, we've been breached or not or something funny is going on. So that's the intrusion detection. And whenever we find something, the, the uh, proverbial shit has hit the fan, we need to know what to do in that case. So we need to have some kind of incident management process or, or, uh, or rules or at least mean at the minimum know who is responsible for, for uh, doing what. So of these processes, I'm talking about basically vulnerability uh, management, vulnerability discovery. And that's why the, uh, we want to do it as uh, agile uh, way as possible because our world today is much uh, agile. So, how do organizations find out that they have a vulnerability or bug that has a security implications? Well, first of all, the, the no-brainer one, incidents. If somebody actually dumps your whole client database and you find out about it from, from, uh, from Troy Hunt or someone, that is a kind of signal that you actually have a vulnerability somewhere. But that's kind of like late in the, in the cycle of, of things. Things have already gone wrong at that point. But that you actually most of the uh, vulnerabilities come from uh, different kinds of reports, error reports, somebody reports that, hey, uh, try to do this, and then I got this really weird uh, error report so is there something weird going on? And so that somebody investigates and then there's, oops, this is actually a security issue. Um, but these kind of reports can come from, uh, from anyone who has access to that resource. And that's something that we want to leverage. And of course, security audits and reviews are a good uh, ways of, of figuring that out. But here I'm talking about, uh, the rest of the talk is talking about bug bounties. Has anybody heard about bug bounty? Well, almost everybody, so what are you doing here? <laughs> um, has anyone used bug bounties as part of the organizations? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. You can go and talk to him and afterwards as well if you want a, a real um, uh, stories with that. Anyway, 
bug bounty program is a uh, structured program where an organization actually pays a security researcher, also known as hacker, um, if they report a security vulnerability in a responsible manner. And the key here, the two key words is payment and responsible disclosure. So, because uh, years ago, when hackers found something, they had like two uh, options. Either try to basically um, uh, sell their the finding on a dark market or somewhere and, and try to get money for that. Or they try to contact the organizations and say, hey, you've got a problem here, could you please fix it? And when lots of people uh, try to contact random organization with the observation, 90% of the organization don't have any kind of contact addresses that they uh, accept security reports on. And if they have, uh, who knows where, when they're going to answer or, or if they are going to answer at all. And if you send a random uh, report that, hey, I was able to see some of your client information, the uh, it's very <laughs> likelihood is very high that the next you're going to call is from their lawyers. And, and somebody's uh, putting a police after you. So this is not the way to do it. That's why bug bounty is very important. We have a structured way of handling these reports from outside parties, actually uh, giving some uh, incentives to uh, report that with money. So these programs, they call the programs because they have a, a target that is defined. It's a box. It might be from a single application and it's API backend. It can be a platform. It can be a whole company infrastructure. For example, whole IP address range, for, uh, for example. And that would be a good uh, playing ground. Uh, but basically, there are lots of these programs around. Each have been set up slightly differently. So reading the rules of these programs is really uh, important if you want to take part in it. And the payments. Well, uh, the good part is, is that actually the organization setting up the program can define what is the payment structure. They usually define the maximum payout if you are able to get the root compromise in the box and, and uh, do whatever in their uh, infrastructure. That's usually a max payout uh, kind of thing. And it can be from uh, some thousands of euros to 10,000, I think. Uh, Lahi Tapiola has one of the biggest payouts, it's something like 50,000 euros if you are able to move one of the uh, boxes there. And, and the minimum if you find a sort of a misconfiguration that has a sort of minor data leak, you get a, like Nginx version number or, or, or uh, some kind of Java uh, stack trace or something with the assistance, they might give you 50 euros or 100 euros or something like that. So it's a scale and the organization setting up the program is basically uh, defines what is the scale. So what are the key benefits for an organization point, uh, point of view? Um, I can have a talk on this, what is a key benefit for hacker point of view, but if you are talking about organization that has these APIs, first of all, from an organization point of view, it encourages the hackers who are out there and, and investigating things just for fun. And it encourages them to do the right thing and report it before any bad guys actually exploit the situation. So it's a motivation thing. Second, it is actually very cost effective because you are paying only for real vulnerabilities. You're not paying for somebody saying this might be a problem or might not be a problem depending on what, because this is sometimes something I need to write, uh, write in a weasel wording in audit reports because I got no clue <laughs> whether it's a real vulnerability or not. Also, what is interesting that um, what we have found out at Hacker AFI and also with, with um, uh, this is uh, true elsewhere as well, if you've got a public program and have, a, uh, for example, media take attention and, and write an uh, article about it, it actually strengthens your image as an uh, organization that cares uh, of security. Also, if you are uh, trying to sell your APIs or, or your services to third parties, that gives a clear signal that, hey, this is an organization that actually cares about security issues. We've got the process for handling this. It doesn't say that 
you are the most secure in the world because every organization has security issues. But at least there's a process there and uh, you are um, trusting your process. And also uh, it's much more agile than traditional audits. Um, for the past 20 years, uh, most of them I've done different kinds of security audits uh, from uh, hardware boxes to uh, phone applications and web applications and whatever there is. I've probably audited one of those. And uh, I've done like two hundreds of them uh, and things like that. So this is something I really uh, know about. If you pay me to do an audit, you will be uh, restricted because I will give you, this is the week from Monday to Friday that I'm free to do your audit. And I'm not going to do it on Saturday or Sunday or the next Monday because I've got other engagement the next week and I want to have a free weekend. And I'm certainly not going to do uh, more than you paid uh, me for. So if we are uh, agree that, yes, you are paying me for five uh, days, I'm going to do the five days and drop uh, the keyboard when the hours are done. However, I know every time I've done an audit engagement, on the, on the last hour I was writing the report, I'm saying, it would have been so great if I had more time on this because this is an interesting error message I got. I really want to uh, find out what that's really all about, whether it's a security issue. But I'm doing that as a business. That's not really what I'm going to do. Also, if you're paying me to do an audit, me is what you're going to get. My brain, the contents of my brain, my experience. In some uh, ways, I'm very good at doing things. There are some things I do uh, not know or really uh, not a lot about. But and even if I had a colleague, it's still two brains, contents of, of uh, two brains. Also, when I write on the uh, last day my report and, and sign it off and send it to you, it sells the security posture of that particular target at this particular time uh, point of time. And especially organizations that are doing agile um, workflows, continuous integration, continuous deployments, who knows what it's going to application and the infrastructure look like the next week. So I was able to say at that, the, the point of, of uh, the report, the uh, security posture was such. However, because of these problems, when I got uh, and you uh, started uh, understanding what bug bounties were, I was immediately, this is a brilliant idea. Because hackers don't count hours, they do it for fun, basically. Okay, of course, there's more uh, motivation with money in there, but basically because of curiosity, because fun, things like that. They uh, are paid only if they find results. That's good for the organization point of view, not necessarily uh, good for the hacker point of view, but, they, uh, but uh, you get the picture from that. Also, the community of hackers as a whole, uh, hundreds and thousands of people, they have variable and diverse experience. So there are some people who are very uh, good at network stuff, there are uh, great uh, people who are doing uh, API stuff, they are uh, excellent people who are good at, at mobile applications. And also, this can be run continuously. You can have the program on for months, uh, 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 years. Lähitapiola in Finland has had the program running from, I think, from 2015. So they are continuously running it and they are, have paid over 100,000 euros uh, of different um, uh, bounties over these years. Of course, bug bounty is not going to be the silver bullet. It's a good uh, in, in uh, certain ways. However, if you are wanting to do bug bounties, you need to have good internal processes in vulnerability management. You need to have certain maturity to receive these reports and be about sensibly timing the handling of it, because, yeah, because um, 
you can get a uh, bad reputation if you are the black hole of uh, reports. So you need to take in reports, be able to uh, respond to these uh, reports, and then um, uh, doing the payouts. Setting out the program and communication with uh, hackers takes some resources. I'm not going to lie about that. And also, the, uh, the, um, what they, these work best with, with public targets uh, in, in, uh, because the hackers need to access them. There are ways of uh, getting through this. There are lots of uh, organizations who have done, uh, put a test system out there from the internal systems, but uh, uh, that's the um, uh, best way of doing public systems. This is the last slide, uh, really. So if you are interested in how to uh, do uh, a bug bounty program, here are the steps you need to follow. First of all, you need to decide, do a lot of decisions first. You need to decide your target. You need to decide the rules the hackers have to follow. Because, for example, do you want the hackers to be able to do denial of service testing to your production systems? Maybe good idea, maybe not. You also need to figure out the payment uh, structure. What is the high payment, what is low payment, how we're going to uh, go about it. Then you have to decide what type of program are you going to uh, run an open program for, uh, for everybody to take part in. You want to run a, a, a private or closed program where uh, only a select invited hackers can uh, attend and things like that. Then you need to uh, get it out there uh, to the hackers, publish it, and so you have to start receiving reports. So you need to be able to have a good contact point uh, several people reading that, so it's not a single point of failure. You have to be able to do triage, whether it uh, uh, looks legit. Do you need to uh, get more information to reproduce the issue? You need to evaluate how bad of an issue it is. And then you need to add, uh, either reject or accept it and decide the bounty amount. Then you need to communicate with the hackers and eventually you need to pay. Of course, uh, payment, whether you're going to use PayPal for international hackers, but we at HackerFi, for example, do it well above the board from tax uh, point of view. For Finnish hackers, we are actually doing it with better for the, the tax paperwork and things like that. And also, this remediation uh, is, of course, we know as technical people that uh, not all vulnerabilities can be easily fixed. There might be cases where it's like six months until the uh, vendor releases a patch or something and uh, you have to communicate with the hacker so that they don't go public with it before it actually is fixed because otherwise you uh, invite a lot of, of uh, bad actors there. And I think that's about, uh, well, okay, here's the... Uh, 10 second uh, commercial pitch. Anything above the uh, blue line, uh, Hacker FI can help you with. Full stop. <laughs> okay, thank you.